church. Happy almost Thanksgiving. Can you believe it? I know we're all thankful for one little special treasure. Hiding on the back row, little baby Braden is here. What? Awesome. Wow, what a great day. I tell you what, there's a lot to be thankful for. And I hope you feel that way. But if not, by the end of today, hopefully you will. You'll find something that you are indeed thankful. In fact, let me ask you this question. What do you think of when I say the word Thanksgiving? Be honest. What jumps to your mind first? Food, right? Thank you. Honest people. Exactly. And if I had to ask you specifically what food, what would you say? Turkey, right? Anybody not like turkey? Okay. Pray for those people with their hands up. Okay. Two. That's all right. Turkey. How many people recognize this sitcom right here? Oh, yes. Oh, you made it through the glorious 70s then if you raised your hand. What a, what a time of cinema and TV. It was stellar. Now, I, I was a young scutter, so I don't necessarily endorse this show because I, I never really got to watch it because I was just a, a youngling. But I do remember one famous Thanksgiving episode. Oh, yes, we're going there. Oh, yes. Art Carlson is the bumbling manager of the station. He's the tall guy on the right with the uh, comb over. And then you have the hilariously naive weatherman, Les Nesman, on the far, your left. And he would narrate things. Now, in the 70s, you've got to understand, they were struggling to get notoriety and get the name out. So what the, what the going thing was, the, the rage, was to go rent a helicopter and take it and get a crowd of people under and drop things to the crowd below that hopefully people would like. Now, usually they would drop things like T-shirts with maybe like the station letters, WKRP on it. Or if you were really, really wanting to draw a crowd, you would drop cash, 50s and $100 bills, just making it rain. Well, bless his heart, poor Art Carlson, the station manager, didn't quite understand the concept. And since it was Thanksgiving, he decided to drop turkeys. <laughs> turkeys. Fast forward to the end of the show, and he comes in covered with feathers and disheveled, and he says, I kid you not, as God as my witness, I thought turkeys could fly. <laughs> and it was raining. In fact, they made a shirt about it called the first annual turkey drop. It was the only turkey drop. They canceled it. It rained down, mass hysteria, dogs and cats living together. It was carnage. Now remember, this was just an example. Don't send me hate mail. Don't send me to PETA. No turkeys were harmed in the making of this. But this is what comes to mind in a modern America. We think of turkeys and food, and there's nothing wrong with it. I do the same thing. And today we're going to look at one of my all-time favorite Thanksgiving stories from the Bible. It's a story that you've heard all your life. I heard it growing up. And it's one of those great stories that no matter how many times I hear it, I always find new, fresh truth. And this past week, as I reread it, I found four or five, maybe six hidden gems, almost truth grenades that blew my mind, things that I had missed a hundred times. And if you're like me, God's word is never ending. And as you read it, you think, how did I miss that? There is so much here. So this is a Thanksgiving story that doesn't appear on the surface to be a Thanksgiving story. It is the story of Jesus healing the 10 lepers. I don't know about you, but when I think Thanksgiving, I don't automatically think leprosy. In fact, when I hear the word leper or Jesus healing the lepers, I always picture this. He comes and he's healing these, these cheetah-like animals, these lepers. And Jesus says, no, no, not leopards, lepers. Anybody else get that confused as a kid? No? Well, just your weird pastor? Okay. All right. No problem. Let's dive in. Open your Bibles to Luke 17 because we are diving in deep to God's Word today. Luke 17. While you pull that up, let me welcome our online campus. Great to have you with us each and every week. And if you're a guest here today, please stop by our Welcome Center on the way out. We have a gift for you. We're just glad to have you here. I'd love to shake your hand and meet you after church. Luke 17. Everybody got it? All right. Read along. Verse 11. Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers, who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when Jesus saw them, he said to them, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. When God does something great in our life, are you part of the nine that's busy? 
goes off with your life. Thank you, Lord. Boom. Appreciate it. Never seen again? Because we never see these dying again. Or are you the one who comes back with an attitude of gratitude? Because you'll see in this story, Jesus loves grateful people. He loves, there's something special about the bond he has. And it is so amazing when you look deep into this. The Bible records that these, these isolated lepers, they get up. They see him coming. They don't miss this chance. They leap up and they yell out, Jesus, have mercy on us. So right out of the block, we see a great word for us. If we don't get up, we could miss the master walking by. If we don't get up, we could miss the miracle happening. It says they lifted up their voices. Now, see, we read that in English and we think, okay, hey, Jesus, help me. Wee. Oh, no. The Greek rendering here means they shout at Jesus. They shouted at him as they came by. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like it when people shout at me. In fact, if you shout at me, I'm likely to keep walking because it's kind of weird. Who's this creepy guy yelling at me? Much less 10 creepy people yelling at me. But Jesus doesn't even get alarmed. This is so amazing. I've got to ask a question here right off the bat. Why were they shouting at Jesus? Yes! You're safe here. You can answer. They had leprosy. And if you weren't here when we talked about leprosy a couple years ago, let me just give you a recap. Or maybe you've joined the church since then. Leprosy was awful. It was the worst diagnosis you could be given. It's a disease that attacks the extremities first, beginning with the nose and the facial features. And then it goes to the extremities of your hands and your feet. And it starts to cripple the way you can even move. And it is incredibly, especially at that time, they believe incredibly contagious. And it was a horrible, agonizing, slow, painful death. To be diagnosed with leprosy was a death sentence somewhere off in the future, but you were immediately ostracized and sent to live at a leper colony. You couldn't even be in the city. It was so bad that if the wind was blowing, you weren't even allowed to come within 50 yards of another human. 50 yards. Think about that. In fact, if you didn't know you were approaching a leper and they were covered up and you had inadvertently stumbled into their path, do you know they were required by the Mosaic law to yell out to you a warning? You remember, anybody know what they're supposed to yell? Unclean. 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 Don't come any call. Can you imagine how horrifying that would be to have to label yourself that and to yell that out at somebody say, don't come any closer. I am unclean. So trust me, when you hear these 10 men and they're crying out for mercy, they are desperate. We don't get that because we're not desperate about much. We are so blessed. Here in America, almost every one of us has an extra outfit or two or 500 hanging in their closet and more food in the pantry and a roof over our head. You probably had heat on overnight, and you probably have the air conditioning on this afternoon. <laughs> Welcome to North Carolina. We're so blessed. We, we, we can't even identify. No wonder they get up when they see Jesus coming. Is that the Messiah we've been hearing about? It's made it into our leper colony. I think that's him. Notice what they don't cry out for. They don't cry out for food. No mention. They don't cry out for money. They don't have their posters up saying, woo, more higher wages. Social justice, none of that. You know why? Because their need was deeper than that. Their need was for mercy. Mercy. Can you give us mercy? Now, if we can't identify with a leper, man, I get it. But let me ask you this. You ever had a bad day? <laughs> ever had a bad week? Some of you are nodding a lot. You've had a bad month. I get it. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt for it. Murphy's Law. Anybody know what it says? If anything can go wrong, it will. <laughs> you got it, Sister. In the worst possible way. One of my all-time favorite Thanksgiving movies is this one right here. Because everything that could possibly go wrong to Steve Martin does. Right? And bless his heart, he hooks up with Del Griffith to try to help him. And the trains get stopped and broken down. He can't do that. The planes are all diverted. They're going to Oshkosh. He needs to get back to Chicago. The, the car catches fire. His wallet's in the glove compartment. All his money's gone. It's been stolen. He's got little crispy blackened credit cards that can't even be swiped. And finally, he's gone for two or three days with Del Griffith. And he pulls into this hotel, and he's like, Mr. Innkeeper. Have mercy. I'm sorry, I need a room. Have mercy. 
I've been wearing the same underclothes since Tuesday. Please let me come in and have mercy. You can see it on his face. You ever had a day like that? Or a week? Or two? Yeah. You know what it means when God steps in and he delivers and you are thankful when everything, and I mean everything, goes wrong. And perhaps when you read these words as a leper, you're sitting here, you picture him sitting beside the road and you see Jesus passing by. Maybe he's done that to you. He's been walking by you and you never got up. You never called out to him. You've ignored him. But let these lepers' words and their actions say, man, get up. Because if you don't get up and seize the hem of his garment, he is going to walk by and you might miss an incredible moment, a miracle with him. But it didn't stop there. Look what happens next going on. They not only get up, but they go out. They go. They are obedient. It says here in the Luke 17, 13, go, show yourselves to the priests. Y'all, there is hidden gold right there that I have missed. You know, what this, this, you know what this is saying? Let me ask you a question. Why do they have to go? Why go anywhere at all? Remember, these people hadn't been healed yet. That doesn't happen until the next verse. He says, go show yourselves to the priest. And they're like, uh, sir, we're covered with leprosy. We can't go anywhere. You know we're not allowed to go near the temple, much less approach the priest. Are you kidding? Go show yourself to the priest. They didn't balk. They didn't say, we still have source. We still have all these things. We're forbidden to go. They went. They were obedient, even though it didn't make sense. Ooh, I'm preaching to somebody today. Even though it didn't make sense, God tugged at the heart. You need to go. Who is that? Somebody here is dealing with that. You are on the fence about something. Think about this. They were forbidden to go. Why is Jesus saying go anywhere at all? I mean, what is the point of this? Anytime a leper was healed, the law required them to go find a priest and get what is called a certificate of cleansing. Did you know that? You actually had to have, before you could rejoin society, you literally had to have their seal of approval. It was something that if you didn't have that seal of approval, that's awesome. If you didn't have that seal of approval, you could not rejoin society. You were still ostracized. So they had to go show themselves to the priest, which brings up something kind of wild to me, another hidden gem. Why did Jesus say go see a priest and not a doctor? Because in our modern secular society, where, where do we go when we think we need him? We go to the doctor first. Nothing wrong with that. But they doesn't say go to the doctors. And it's because Jesus says go to the priest that most scholars believe these ten were Jews. These ten were of the Jewish faith. He said go to the priest. Oh, except for one. And he was a Samaritan. Now I'm looking in your eyes right now because I want to see who's lighting up at this because that is a very strange statement. And if that doesn't ring alarm bells yet, it will. That is a huge statement right there. Now, going on, we look at the scripture. Look at verse 14. He says, as they went, they were cleansed. This is so key. This is when the healing happens. Oh, man, this is so deep. They had to go in faith and obey. They took action. So I got to ask you this. Do we, when Jesus tells us to do something, do we step out in faith and obey? Because they did. And look what happened. When they stepped out in faith and obeyed, that's when the miracle happened. It wasn't before. Notice that. It wasn't before. It wasn't after. It says, as they went, they were healed. Wow. Now let's bring this down to us here at Apex today. If you think about it, before any great miraculous moving of God in your life, any great work that God did, it probably began with an admonition to go. It probably began with the Holy Spirit tugging at your heart to go somewhere, to do something, to help someone, to give something. Then the ball was in your court. Are you going to be obedient? I love it. All ten lepers, the Jews, the Samaritan, it didn't matter. They obeyed the instructions and they went. And that is such a powerful challenge for us. If Jesus, can he just whisper, go to you, and you do it? Man, I wish I could say 100% of the time I do. I don't know about that. He's telling me to go to a place that I'm forbidden to go. Are you kidding me, Jesus? Come on. You know better. You're one of us. You're one of the Jews. You know. We can't go to the temple. We'll cover with... Wait a minute. And this is so, so amazing. It's not 
before they went, it's not after, it's as they went. And it shows this attitude of faith that church, we are lacking today. Let me ask you a trick question. Had these 10 lepers not headed to the priests, you think they would have been healed? I'll give you a minute. Think about that. Think about what they had to do. They had to step out of faith. Here's the, here's the lesson for it. If we are not obedient to his prompting, to his word, we might miss the miracle. If we don't follow along and do what he says, we're going to miss a beautiful moment as the Lord walks by. We could miss the miracle. They all got up. They all go out, and they all start heading. But from here on out, the roads diverge, and now something strange happens. Nine go this way, and one goes this way. So picture yourself, you're walking with them along the road, and you're talking, you're like, he said, go to the temple, we're going to go, we've got our shawls, we're covered up, and all of a sudden, we notice, wait a minute, my hands look normal, you look normal, you look normal, and we start walking, and all of a sudden, noses are back, and eyes still open, and flesh is no longer hanging off of them like corpses, and they start freaking out, and they're high-fiving, and they're like, they're hugging because they couldn't do that, they're so excited, and they're dancing, and having a great time, and things are going berserk. And one of them says, man, i got to go see my wife. I haven't been able to get close to her, much less hold her in a decade. Pew, he's gone. Another one says, I have a newborn son. i got a baby, Braden, and I have not been able to hold him. I haven't even been able to see what color his eyes are. I am, so, I am gone. Maybe there was a teenager with him. I haven't been able to go to the marketplace. Man, I haven't been able to go shopping. I've got an iPhone 10 that is so out of date, it needs an update. I've got to go. <laughs> Pew, and they're gone. All nine, two, 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 except one. One stays, looks at the healing, and turns around and comes back. You know what's so amazing about this? Do you know this guy had family too? I'm sure he had family he wanted to see. I'm sure he had a business he wanted to attend to. I'm sure he had friends that he couldn't wait to go hug and high five and say, I can't believe you're back. Where have you been? Oh my goodness, you were at that calling. But something was more important to him, church. Something compelled him to not race off after the other nine, but turn around and go back to Jesus, the one who healed him, and say, thank you. Do we? Think about it. And, and when he goes back, I love this. It's not just like, hey, Jesus, thanks, buddy. Love you. I got to go. Look at the scriptures. He says, he comes back with a loud voice glorifying God. And he falls down on his face at his feet and gives him thanks. Man, that's gratitude. I love how the message reads. Look at the message. He says, one of them, when he realizes that he was healed, turned around, came back, shouting his gratitude, glorifying God. He kneeled at Jesus' feet so grateful he couldn't thank him enough. That's a grateful person. That is such a lesson. But the story doesn't end here. It's something very odd that happens. There's five simple words that are about to show up that honestly look out of place. They look pretty much irrelevant to me. And it's five simple words that say this, and he was a Samaritan. Now we come to it. Why put that in there? Why is there a need to differentiate that? Why does it single him out as a Samaritan? Remember, guys, Samaritans were the lowest of the low. They weren't even considered fully human by some people. Samaritans were so detestable, they would, they would walk miles out of their way to avoid stepping foot into their country. Think about that, miles. I won't go five feet out of my way to check the mail. There are, think about what they do. Think about how much they put to, no respectable Jewish person would ever be associated with a Samaritan this foreigner. So what was this one Samaritan doing among nine Jews? And there's another hidden lesson for us. In this environment, these people would have never been seen together. Never. It, I cannot stress to you how important this is. They do not coexist. They do not hang out. But something happened in this circumstance, and they had a common thread. Now, I can look in your eyes and see that not all of you are getting it. So I'm going to put it in a modern-day relationship so you can understand. This is kind of what it was like. Here you have Troy and Gabriella and Sharpay. None of these guys hang out with each other. 
You got the jocks, you got the brainiacs, you got the artsy tootsy people, and they're doing their thing, and none of them cross paths. But yet, by the end of this movie, they're all saying, We're all in this together. <laughs> and they're having a great time. They are unified. Please tell me that was not live on stream. I got to remember that. They're unified. And they're all in this together. You can't do You have to do the moves. You have to. You hear that? Now, if that's too recent, and I see some of us who are maybe over 40 years old, maybe you need to go back a decade. And maybe this is something that will resonate with you. So you got Screech Powers. You got A.C. Slater. You got Mr. Belding. You got Kelly Kapowski. None of them have anything to do with each other except... At the end of every episode, strangely and euphorically enough, they get together and Bayside High is united. And all is right with the world in 30 short minutes. Now I can tell some of us aren't 90s people either. Maybe you're like me. And you grew up in the 80s. Or earlier. And that's good because you experienced the golden age of cinema. The golden age, where you remember the glorious 80s. And if I had to put this parable into a modern day format, I would put it like this. Oh, yes. The breakfast club, where you have the criminal, the athlete, the basket case, the princess in the brain. Y'all, here's where this is all heading. All five of these people had Saturday detention. I mean, all day detention. And when they walked through those doors, they couldn't be further apart from each other. They could have been Jews and Samaritans. They could have been Christians and Muslims. They, could, they couldn't be further apart, yet something incredible happens. By the end of this day, they have bonded because of their common misery. Their, their detention brought them together in this brotherhood of suffering. And they came together. Y'all, just like that, these ten lepers... They had this common misery joining them together, this brotherhood of suffering. Leprosy had shattered and removed cliques and stereotypes and pride. And they had come together and evened the playing field. This, this should teach us such a huge lesson about each other, church. Don't miss this. I'm not just talking about Breakfast Club now. I'm talking about Potter's Hand Club. We are not supposed to look at people and look down our noses at people who are different than us. We're not supposed to look down our noses in pride and say, you don't make what I make. You don't dress the way I dress. You don't smell like I think I smell, or I hope I do. See what I'm saying? Oh, it's getting real now. Bill, what, what a lesson. When they came out, they were together. Now, no matter how many times I read this, though, I'm so shocked that only one of them returns to say thanks. Now, here's the strange part. Check this out. Notice of the ten men who were healed, the one who was probably knowledgeable the least about Jesus, the Samaritan, is the one who comes back. It's not the priests, it's not the Jews, it's not the pastors. It's this Samaritan. He comes back. All of them were healed from leprosy, but only one comes back to give gratitude. And we don't even know the leper's name. All we know is his example and how Jesus reacted. So he comes back and he stands before Jesus. Now I love this. Jesus just, oh, he cuts through so much noise and junk with questions. You ever notice that about him? I love that about him. He asked three questions. Three, boom, 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 rapid fire questions that honestly he didn't need to ask because I know he already knew the answer. He asked them to force a point of reflection. Almost rhetorical. He says, were there not ten cleansed? I just see you. <laughs> I'm looking behind you to see if I see the, uh, no. Where are the nine? Were there not any others to be found to return to give glory to God except you? <laughs> The foreigner? This is incredible. And if you listen, it's almost like if you could lean in. I can almost imagine a, a ring of sadness and surprise in Jesus' voice. Did none come back except the one who knew the least about me? He never went to synagogue. He didn't go to church. And he comes back, and he's the great one, and says, thanks. So let me ask you a very pointed question. What about you? Which team are you on? Maybe you're on a similar road where you had an urgent matter or you experienced a crisis and you called out to God for mercy and he stepped in. You stepped up in faith and he showed up and showed off. 
And when the blessing of his answer came, you went right on with your life. And we didn't stop to give him thanks. Maybe you're hanging out with the nine right now. You didn't even realize, you know what? I never went back to say thank you. And we missed a really beautiful moment with the Savior. I know which team I want to be on. You know what reveals it? How Jesus responded. Look at the next verse. Look at what Jesus says to the one who came back. I love this. He says, arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Your faith has made you well. I love that. Clearly, Jesus is pleased with gratitude. Clearly, Jesus, when he sees his child say thank you, it moves his heart. Now, let me ask you as a parent, are you pleased when you do something nice for your kids? And they turn around with gratitude and say thank you. How much more if we, being evil, will our heavenly Father give good things? How much more joy must it bring when we turn around and we say thank you, God? I mean, do we really grasp this in 2018 at Apex? The power of gratitude and what it does to the heart of our Father? Anybody ever heard of Max Lucado? Great pastor author, sold thousands and thousands of books, best-selling. And then, before that, he was a professor. Not in America, in Brazil. He had already made a little bit of a name. He didn't have millions, but he had a little bit of money. And he was a tall American walking amongst shorter people who he stood out big time. And he said one day as he was walking to teach a class at university, he feels a tug on his pant leg. Without even looking, he knew exactly who it was. He turned and he saw the very stereotypical five-year-old boy with dirt smudged on his face and hair unkempt everywhere, tattered clothes. And he holds up his hands and he says just a few short words in broken English. Please, sir, bread. Please, sir, bread. Nine times out of ten, Max said he would nod and turn and reluctantly go on his way. Because he knew in that city, you usually can't, there's so many, you can't feed them all. And once you feed one, they swarm on you. And he didn't mean anything bad by it. He just, he just physically cannot financially afford it. You can't help this one. And he was getting ready to turn, and all of a sudden he said something compelled him. And he looked at the little boy, and he took his hand, and he said, come with me. And they walked to the nearest coffee shop. It wasn't fancy. But he walked in, and he goes up to the guy, and he says, I will have a cup of coffee for me, and anything, any pastry, no matter how big, whatever he wants for my friend here. Max did this. He walked to the end of the counter to get his coffee, knowing that would be the last he saw of him, because every time he's done this before, the little boy grabs whatever pastry it is, flies out the door, and runs into the street. And everybody mobs him, and they, they cheer and do what they do to pass it out. And as Max was waiting for his coffee, he felt eyeballs on the back of him. And as he turned and looked, the five-year-old boy was standing there, staring at this pastry. And he held it up, and he looked at him, and he said something so simple to Max, it changed his life. He looked at him, and he said, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. And he turned, and he quietly left the shop and disappeared. Max said, in that moment, looking into those eyes, seeing that gratitude, he said, I kid you not, I would have bought him the entire store. I would have emptied my wallet. He had but to ask. His gratitude overwhelmed Max Lucado. You know what he did? He sat right down. He skipped his class. He was late. He sat there for 30 minutes. He couldn't get this poor little boy out of his mind. It moved him to such compassion. He was late for his class. Just thinking about this little one boy begging him who came back to say thank you. Which leads me to my truth grenade and my challenge all in one. What do you give to the God who has everything? What do you give to somebody who needs nothing? You give him your gratitude. The God of the universe who needs nothing delights in your thanks. So you're going to give it to him? You have a chance to move the heart of the creator of the universe with a heart of gratitude. So today, that's what we're going to do. 
We're going to pray, and then I'll open up the altar. And if you want to come just spend a few seconds with the Lord, just thanking him. I know which team I want to be on. I don't want to be part of the nine that got everything I needed or even what I thought I needed or what I didn't, and God spared it, and I go about my business. I want to be the one who comes back to say thanks. And I'm not going to wait for Thanksgiving to do it. I'm going to thank him today. Bow with me. God, I thank you for the power of your word and the simplicity of the truth that it contains. Lord, you are good and you are in this place. And Lord, as a church, we publicly want to go on record and say thank you. Thank you for blessing your church. Thank you for blessing us individually, corporately. Thank you for blessing our homes. Thank you for blessing our health and our finances that we could be here today and drive here today. That our heart beats in our chest another day. Lord, you are the giver of all good things, and for that, we pause to say thank you. We're not going to wait for a holiday. We're not going to wait for a man-made hour. We want to cry out with the leper who came back joyously and shouted his praise to you and said, thank you. You are good. Receive our gratitude, Lord. God, I pray for those in this room, Lord, if there's a heavy burden, that they would lay it at the altar today. If they don't know you as Savior, as friend, as Redeemer, Lord, I pray that they would pull someone aside today and ask them, what is this about? Tell me more. Lord, for those who are here that may have been following your road but never have followed you into baptism, God, I pray that you would lay it on their heart today. They would take my hand and tell me, it's time to be all in. Lord, we don't want to go with the nine. We want to be the one that is found faithful. So that at the end of it all, we hear, well done, good and faithful servant. That's our prayer this morning. We submit it in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. If you're a guest, we just like to sing one last song before we go. The words will be on the screen in just a minute. We'll stand. You'll see a few people coming and kneeling at the altar. You're welcome to do that. No one will bother you. It's a private time. It's the highlight of our week because we get to have a moment with the Lord. Whatever God's asking you to do, let's just stand together. Be obedient as we sing. The words are on the wall. You come now. The altar is open. Just be obedient as the Lord passes by. Lord, we do give you our praise today. What an awesome God you are. We worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated just for one minute. I want to share a couple quick things with you before you go. This Wednesday night, no refuel. Okay? This Wednesday night, no refuel. Because the following day, Thursday is Thanksgiving, we are here. We are opening our doors. If you know someone who doesn't have much, or maybe doesn't have family nearby, and you know that they just sit home alone or something, we're opening up our doors for that very reason. We're going to be here, anyone who wants to. There's no pressure. If you've already got plans, you go do those plans, okay? Remember, Potter's Hand is a guilt-free zone. You don't have to be doing anything like that. You do what God leads you to do. But if you need a place to eat, I'm going to be here with my family, and there's going to be probably 30 or 40 others. If you want to come and you want to bring a dish, feel free to bring a dish. You don't have to. Don't let that stop you. God has always provided more than enough. If you have a dish that you want to drop off and then go on about your plans, you can do that. See Karen Miller? She's kind of been gracious to head this up, and God has always provided for us. This Thursday, 1 o'clock. Okay? Any questions on that? All right. The following Wednesday, Refuel will be back on. That's the 29th, I believe, 28th. We're going to have a Refuel dinner in all adult classes in the new East Campus. Okay? We're going to be over there. Not this Wednesday. The following Wednesday, New East Campus. The kids will still have their classes back here. But in here, the children will be setting up for a Christmas carol. The story of Scrooge and all that, it's going to be all over and they're setting everything up. So we're moving next door on the following Wednesday. All right? Thumbs up if you got me. You with me? Awesome. I want to have Pastor Bill and Diane. If you guys would come up, I just have uh, some exciting news and uh, wanted to share this with you. There she is. All right. You were hiding there on the second row. I love it. Most of you already know Pastor Bill and Diane, but if not, you need to get to know them. They are awesome, awesome, great people. And I have an exciting announcement that I want to share. Um, most of you have known that our church has been growing substantially and exponentially. And many of you have expressed concern for my longevity, <laughs> my hair loss, my weight gain, and my stress load. And uh, we've been praying about this for many, many moons. And I've uh, met with the leadership team, and we've been praying about this. And we have graciously seen this awesome couple willingly step partly out of retirement and come on board as staff as my associate pastor today. And I want to give God the glory. And we are so, so excited to have you, brother. We are fired up. 
These guys are awesome. Both him and Diane, they've already been pastors here. But here's what we want to do. We wanted to make it official for this reason. When you see him up here, he represents me. He represents the church. Most importantly, he represents the Lord. And if he's calling you or he's giving you some, some details or something, you'll know where it's coming from. Like, why is Pastor Bill doing that? He is officially on board. He's already been preaching. He's already been covering for me and doing some great things. Not alone the mission stuff that he takes care of, but this is a fountain of wisdom, he and Diane both. And here's what I want us to do. I'm going to take them out to lunch, so don't take them too long, but I'd like them to just remain down front. Will you come by when we dismiss? Just give them a hug and, a, and an attaboy, and thank you for coming on board, and thank you for giving Pastor Matt a breath. <laughs> it would be awesome. All right? So if you're happy about that, let them know it. We love you guys. Thank you so much. We are fired up to have you on board officially. Welcome, brother. All right, let me pray, and then we'll be dismissed. God, you are so good. Lord, I thank you for good friends. I thank you for the Hagedises, for their powerful testimony, their years of ministry, and the wisdom they hold. We welcome them on board your team. Lord, we thank you for this great church and what you're doing here. We take no credit for it. We point it to you. You give all glory. You get all credit. You get all praise. Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do this week on Thursday. I pray that you would bring people that we haven't even met that you would bring people who may not have food to eat or a place to stay. Lord, help us to meet them and to be the hands and feet of you, Lord. Thank you for this great day. Would you dismiss us with your protection? We ask this now in Jesus' powerful name. And all God's children said, amen. amen. amen.